Good morning, Restore Community Church. It is my pleasure to be with you once again. My name is Dustin Pruitt, if you do not know, and we are in the middle of our Messy Church series. I think this series um, is so apt. Uh, we're messy people, like humans are messy people. So the church can be messy as well. We just can't help but bring it with us. Uh, I want to reference Pigpen from the Peanuts. I don't know if that, that cartoon strip made it all the way over here to the UK from America, but Pigpen, he just had this cloud of dust everywhere he went. He left a trail of dust and dirt, as little kids often do. So here we are in the messy church, and today we're going to zero in on what Paul was writing to the church in Corinth in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the first 16 verses of that. Now, it's a, it's a blocky chunk of text. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to kind of pull the, the, the knowledge, pull the points out of it out of it as we go. So I'm going to dive right in. If you want to pull your Bibles out to kind of read along with me, uh, that might help you. I'll give you another moment. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to be starting in verse 1, going to verse 16. Uh, I have here the NIV version for any of you that are reading with me as well. Uh, why don't we start it off? Now, for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not, not a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God, and one has this gift, another has that. Now, to the unmarried and to the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, so be it. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will serve your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Oh, I, I said serve your husband. I mean save your husband. I misread that. So save your husband or husband, save your wife. Okay, so let's kind of break that down, if you will. We've read the scripture now. Let's go into uh, what... The first thing I want to pull out, and that's the call and commitment of marriage. That Paul is beginning by addressing marriage directly, offering a clarity that this culture in this day and age is lacking. That they are grappling with immorality and confusion. And maybe you're thinking, and I'm hoping you're thinking of today's day and age. This isn't just the day of Corinth, but today's day and age that's grappling with sexuality and immorality and confusion. And in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 2, he writes, Each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. 
that this marriage is intended to display God's faithfulness, his unity, his love. And I think Hosea chapter 2 illustrates this so perfectly. Starting in verse 19, it says, this is the Lord speaking, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and I will acknowledge you in the Lord. That God's covenant with his people is this enduring commitment. That it's me and you together. Just as I am making this promise to you, you are making this promise to me. A covenant promise goes both ways. So when it comes to the context of marriage, this covenant is so important. So we should be pure to one another. That God's covenant is beautifully illustrated in Ephesians chapter 5, saying, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. That Paul is describing Christ as the groom in the church, as his beautiful blushing bride. That marriage then is not only between husband and wife purely in a physical sense. It is a picture, it is a reflection of Christ's love for the church. It is a reflection of the relationship that God desires with us. God doesn't just desire to be boys. He doesn't desire to be friends. He desires to be closer than a brother. He desires intimacy to really know one another. And in a society of Corinth and in a society today where immorality seems to just be gaining ground and traction and speeding up, Paul is addressing the need for sexual intimacy to be within the context of marriage only. Paul's point is clear that sex is not something shameful, it's not dirty. God created sex. I'm here to tell you, God created sex. This, I, if there's any kids in the room that are giggling and snickering right now, it's the way the world is. God created it. It's a beautiful and wonderful thing when it's in the right context. It's meant to be enjoyed. He says in verse 3, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. Within this con- covenant, this 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 promise of marriage, sexual intimacy is healthy. It is a loving expression that even honors God. Can you, could you imagine? It honors God when when it's within this confine. However, Paul, he puts an emphasis on a mutual respect between husband and wife, a love within marriage, noting that neither spouse has authority over the other over their own body, but they are to honor one another. That marriage, it's not a power struggle. It's not a tussle, but it's a partnership marked by mutual love, by care, by respect. And he he even suggests that abstaining from sex and committing that time towards God in mutual agreement so that neither spouse is tempted. Paul is talking about the power of temptation can even come in within the confines of marriage. So why God in Hosea chapter 2 is talking about, I will betroth you in compassion and in justice and in love and in righteousness. So too with our betrothed, should we be righteous with them? Should we treat them with justice, with compassion, and with love? There's this mutual understanding with one another that we have to have. That, that is Paul and through God, or God through Paul is telling us here the way that it needs to be organized, that a marriage needs to be.
Paul also highlights the importance of an enduring commitment in marriage. For those of us who are married, we're in it for the long haul. Here to our dying breath, the long haul, he calls for husbands and wives to work towards reconciliation if they face challenges. This is a call of reconciliation that reflects God. Once again, a, a, a wedding, a marriage is just a reflection of our relationship with God. So it needs to reflect it. That yet we were still enemies of Christ. He reconciled and died for us. That sometimes we need to lay down our pride, lay down our flesh, our comfort, what we think we know is right. If it's outside of the Bible, maybe we need to reconcile. That Paul even addresses situations where an unbelieving spouse is married to a believer, in which case the believer, if, if the unbeliever leaves, the believer is no longer bound just with the relationship with Christ, that there are sadly those that deny him. It doesn't change his love, but his love lets them go. Such a strange thing to think about, and it's coming through this, once again, context of marriage, that there's something here. Now, I, I'm going to quickly move on to the next point in a moment. Uh, for those of you that are single, that are unwed, this isn't saying you've got to be married. We're going to move on in here in a second, but hold with me. This call to marriage, though, is a high call. It's a weighty responsibility. It's not just something to take lightly, to do it a whim, but it's a reflection of God's own commitment and love. For those of us that are married, our commitment to our spouse is an opportunity to witness and show the faithfulness of God's love, even in difficult times, and for the church as a whole that is built on relationships, that is built on family, it's got to be built right. The foundation has to be set. For those of you who are part of Restore Community Church, if you're married, you need to love your spouse to, to find reconciliation, if, if at all possible. to provide strength to your betrothed in righteousness, in justice, in compassion, and in love. It's so important. In a time where it feels like the world is pressing into the church, trying to twist and change things, some things are, oh, oh it's, it's all okay. If it feels good, it must be good. As long as nobody finds out, we'll fill in the blank in, in your own life. God is clearly stating this mess. Can we get the mess out of the church? Now, my second point of, of today's talk, that there's a purpose and a potential in singleness that cannot be found in married life. Paul speaks to this unique call and potential of being single. In verse 7, he says, I wish that all of you were as I am, acknowledging that there are benefits to being single that married people don't got. Somebody who's single, their mind is solely focused on the Lord. Where those that are married, you've been called to to honor your wife as well as the Lord. You're split a little bit. Where if you're single, you have a unique place of rest, a unique place of purpose to commit in fully. I can think of myself of the amount of hours that I volunteered for my local church before I was married. I had a full-time job, nine to five at, at a law firm, a mesothelioma law firm, and I was teaching seven Bible studies a week. And I didn't even blink about it. I was at over people's houses all the time teaching the Bible. I didn't even think about it. It was easy. 
I didn't even know tiredness. And plenty of people now are like, oh, I live tired. There's a purpose and benefit of singleness. And a lot of people prop up and sadly, I'm, I'm going to stand here as a member of the modern day church and I want to apologize to everyone who is single or widowed out there how sadly we have marginalized you. And it, it might not be outright, it might not be outright stated, though I, sadly myself I have heard it outright stated when I was years ago when I was looking for a position and I was applying for churches because I felt this call of God in my life to be a pastor. And I, I would apply and they'd say, we don't hire unmarried pastors. And I would, I would rage. How dare you? The Bible says it is better to be unmarried because your full soul focuses on God. And they would prop up this verse in Genesis where it says it's better for man not to be alone as like, boom, we got you. We pulled the rug out your feet. Where's your argument now, Mr. Single Man? When, when that's, we're, man's not supposed to be alone. We're not hermits. We're not supposed to, we're supposed to be in the, in, in the confines, if you will, of fellowship, of the body, of the brothers and sisters united in Christ. But sadly, the modern day church is often focused on families, family ministry. What events can we do? Are they appealing to young families? Oh, you're single, you're 25. Have you met anybody yet? Do you, is, there somebody, is there something brewing? Do you know, like, are you going to be just like me, just like we are and reflect us and be just like us? Where the Bible clearly states that there is a potential in singleness that cannot be found with, with, within a married couple. Now, neither is better than the other. But Paul's perspective on singleness is influences by the reality that he lived in, the context of persecution and expectation of Christ's imminent return, something we should also be living in today. As Paul writes in verse 32 through 34, an unmarried person is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. He highlights that singleness provides an un divided opportunity to serve God wholeheartedly. Now, sometimes God has called us to serve our spouses, has called us to serve our children, our, our parents, to serve our family. But this doesn't exclude those without that. For those who are single today, whether by choice or circumstances, Paul's words, I hope, offer you encouragement. That singleness is not a lesser status. It is a state filled with potential and opportunity to pursue this calling that God has placed on your life. And as a church, we need to support the single community. It can't all be about family ministry. It can't all be about couples like, oh, I wish we could make another couple friend. Oh, I wish we could invite them over. If only they were married. I will, oh, if only we could find them a husband or if we could only find him a wife. Guys, I'm, I'm here to tell you those words can be poisonous. And that they have no place in the church. That God may have put a calling on their life, and whether we know it or not, we could be actively working against that. Though it may come from a place of love, you just don't know. So we need to provide support and community and opportunities for fellowship just as equally for those that are single as those that are married, for those with children. And lastly, Paul addresses this topic of divorce, recognizing that there's pain and brokenness in existing relationships. You're living at home, but your, your enemies divided. That divorce is a sensitive subject. We see it in Scripture that while it is permitted under circum cer certain circumstances, it's not God's original intention or design 
it's emphasized that yes, cases of sexual unfaithfulness, divorce is permitted, but it emphasizes it's not ideal. It's not God's best for us. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul extends this teaching, particularly in verses 10 through 16. He calls for reconciliation in marriage and urges spouses not to separate. However, he acknowledges that there's an unbelieving spouse. The spouse chooses to leave. That's fine. God's love can let it go. In today's world, we recognize that there are other circumstances such as abuse where safety and protection become priority while divorce should never be taken lightly. I, I stand here today understanding that God's heart is for our well-being and our safety. And in cases of abuse, divorce may be the necessary step. I, feel, I, I want to stand here and hopefully if there are people out there fully disagree with me and you're upset, please contact me. You can contact Ian and Ian will, will, will let me know the error of my ways. But I want to say here that if you are trapped in a marriage that is destroying you, please find safety. Please find a safe harbor. Please Go to somebody and find a way out. If reconciliation is not possible, let's get you to safety. Because if God can forgive all sins, He can forgive you the sin of marrying the wrong person. If He can forgive the murderer, if he can forgive the thief, he can forgive somebody for just marrying the wrong person. Divorce will always bring deep pain and loss, whether the deep pain and loss happens the time of the divorce onwards or the deep pain and loss happened until the divorce and it's gone. That the church is called to be a place of healing and restoration and to offer support and care and community, even those affected by divorce, not to shun, not to turn away, not to think lesser than. I want to quote Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Whatever your path may hold, past, whatever your past may hold, there is grace a new life in Christ Jesus. So as we reflect, as we see God's wisdom, and as I hope you see, as, as clearly as I've seen, and hopefully I've clearly expressed it to you, that God's wisdom and compassion from this text for all aspects of our relationships, whether we're married, whether we're single, whether we're divorced, God has a purpose in it a plan for our lives, a plan for your life, that our calling is to live out that purpose faithfully. That this whole talk of messy church is to realize that there's a mess to help clean up the mess that God sees and knows where we're at and He doesn't reject us. So for those of us that are married, let us honor that covenant. I'm going to say it again of justice and righteousness, of compassion and love that God has promised us, we promise to our spouse. For those that are single, that we embrace them and, and they embrace their unique capabilities for service for the kingdom. And for those that have experienced divorce to know that God's grace covers all things and that you have a place of community here at Restore Community Church a place of healing, a place of restoration. So as the church, the bride of Christ, let us stand together and support our family, married, single, divorced, let us support one another because that's what God has called us to. So we sweep this mess out the church as the world ever tries to bring in more immorality, we sweep it out the door. And we welcome the people with open arms, no matter their circumstances.
Why don't we pray? Father, we thank you for your word, for your wisdom. Speaks ever still today. That, Father, you know our circumstances. It feels like th this letter that Paul wrote to Corinth can just be the letter written to London 2024. So, Father, we thank you for speaking, for showing us the best way. And if we just follow it and seek you, Father, we can be a bride before you without blemish. So, Father, we love you and we thank you. And everyone says amen and amen. Thank you for stopping by, everybody. Please tune in next week as we continue on in this series of Messy Church. I think it's, it's one of the best. I, I, I almost say this every, every series we do, but it feels like we're just getting better and better. We're, we're just getting closer and closer to God. I just I feel energized. I could dance. So join us next week. You do not want to miss it. Until then, bye.